Are we blessed? Hmm. Today is our third and final part of this series of our look at the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we looked at some of the history of the sermon, how the church historically has grappled with interpreting it. It is an invitation into another world, the kingdom of heaven, to be experienced now here on earth. Jesus lays out how we enter this kingdom and the kind of person that it produces. It does not line up with our way of living, not achievable by any human effort, and therefore strikes us as strange. The spirituality of Jesus is based on a change within, a righteousness that only comes from God, a life only experienced by faith in him. Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with a list of people who are blessed. This section of the passage from verses 3 to 12 is referred to as the Beatitudes. I used to always think Beatitudes came from the idea that this is the attitude we should be. That's where I thought the word came from. However, that's not quite right. The word beatitude comes from the Latin, the word beatus, which means blessed. So anglicized, we get beatitudes. The beatitudes are also referred to in parts of the church around the world as macarisms. Macarisms. That comes from the Greek word makarios, which means blessed. So some churches refer to the beatitudes as beatitudes, and other churches refer to them as makariasms. So let's hear from Jesus. Who are the beatus? Who are the blessed people? Reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. I think we do have the scripture somewhere there. Do we, do we have it? I think we do. Nope. Okay. So listen closely. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hmm. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they read this passage is to think, oh, I'm blessed because I'm poor. I'm blessed because I'm sad. I'm blessed because I want peace. I'm blessed because people falsely accuse me and say all kinds of evil against me. Do you think... Donald Trump thinks he is blessed when people and he hears all those insults thrown at him? <laughs> is that his first thought? I don't think so. This is not a type of solace for people who are experiencing such things. Rather, it is a description of a kingdom of heaven person, how they look in our world. Remember, this is not a list of things for us to do but the description of one's inner character. It is not something that can be achieved by effort. This is not a to-do list. And we went over this in details last week, as well as in previous messages on the Sermon on the Mount. This description laid out by Jesus can only exper be, be experienced when God, in his mercy, fills us with his righteousness. Moreover, that word blessed 
Now we read there, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart. That word blessed is used in pagan literature at the time of Jesus and at the time of Matthew writing his gospel. And it meant the highest state of happiness and well-being that one could achieve. It was the kind of joy and happiness that the gods enjoyed. It is a heavenly joy, a heavenly peace. It is indicative of being in the kingdom of heaven. This isn't just saying, oh, how are you today? I'm blessed. How are you? That's not the kind of blessed that this is referring to. This is exuberant joy. In Philippians, Paul speaks of a joy that transcends all understanding. It's heavenly joy. This is supreme blessing. It's an inner joy, an inner state that remains with us through all of the circumstances of life, even through the tough times. It's not a false happiness, which tries to ignore the reality of one's situation, but provides an underlying foundation which remains with them through the horrors and pain of life. It's not denial, but it faces reality head on, knowing that there is something greater than what the natural eye sees and experiences. The Beatitudes are the description of a person who is experiencing the kingdom of heaven on earth, Jesus of whom proclaimed that the kingdom of heaven is now upon them, and this is what it looks like. The list of kingdom people begins with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit is to recognize our spiritually bankrupt state. Do we really recognize how much we need Jesus? Do we really understand what he did on the cross for us? Why are we so blessed, euphorically happy, to recognize that we are spiritually bankrupt? Why would I be happy about that? Hmm. It's because the pressure is off. One glimpse of our spiritual condition and we realize that there is nothing we could possibly do to remedy it. All of our effort to be good people, all of our self-righteousness, all of our striving, the bending of our will to make us do what we are supposed to do does not make one iota of difference to our spiritual condition. The poor in spirit recognize their helpless state and turn to God in trust, in faith, the only thing that can save us from our worldly state. And without this, we will never enter the kingdom of God and experience the incredible joy, peace, and life that comes with it. George Buttrick, in the Interpreter's Commentary, points out, poverty of spirit is the root of the virtues. It's the root of the virtues. See, all of our goodness comes from recognizing our bankruptcy of them, abandoning our own hope and effort to practice the virtues and entrust relying on God to transform us, yielding a flow of them naturally from within. William Hendrickson in the New International Commentary puts it this way, we obtain a righteousness of inner condition and outward conduct. The two are inseparable. It's an inner condition that results in outward conduct. Jesus, right after that, goes on to say, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Those who mourn see their sinful state, the state of those around them and the state of our world. There's much to mourn about. In our world. And the kingdom person sees clearly our sinful state. The people of the kingdom of God are moved by the plight of others. And the mourning is a result of our eyes opened to our true sinful disconnection from God. And when we step into the kingdom of God, only then do we truly recognize how disconnected from God we have been. Only then do we recognize how disconnected from God our world is? Only then do we get a glimpse 
of what we are supposed to be like, what the world ought to be like, what the kingdom of God within us looks like. And the response to such a state is salvation, not in ourselves, not in our government, not in a new religion or self-help solutions, but in a Savior, Jesus Christ. And that word comfort, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted, that word comfort means to call to the side of. This mourning summons the aid of God. Those who mourn call on the aid of God. The only one who can remedy one's revelation of their sin and the world's sinful state. So if you've never experienced a glimpse of our sinful state, our disconnection from God, ask him. Ask him for a vision of this. Ask him to show the true spiritual condition of ourselves and those around us. Many people don't see how we are sinful, what disconnection of God really is. And so many of us see ourselves as good people. And by earthly standards, many of us are good people. We don't see that we are spiritually impoverished. We don't understand the need for mourning. But the person who experiences the kingdom of God recognizes how disconnected they have been and the world around them and evokes such a response. Being a kingdom of heaven person evokes such a response. It also evokes meekness in our character. And that word meek in the Greek means one who shows goodwill to humanity, lacks any pretense, lays aside their own pride as God takes priority in their life. So they see the poverty, the spiritual poverty of our situation. They react to it in mourning and see Jesus as their Savior, which wipes away any pretense or pride in their lives. Meekness is a product of it. Now, meekness is not sad resignation. Meekness is wise and powerful. Those who are meek, it says, will inherit the earth. Now, contrast this to the power struggles of today. People who fight and cling to power only to abuse and use the people they rule to get more for themselves. Consider King David and his rise to power. He was meek. He lacked any pretense, did not strive for power, but trusted God in all things to see it happen. But don't be mistaken, David was meek, but he was a fierce warrior. We have a, we have a bad understanding, a bad image of what meek means, don't we? No, just get rid of that. <laughs> it's hard to erase that, me- that image in our heads. David was a fierce warrior. He was known as a warrior king. He lacked any pretense. He did not strive for power, but trusted God to see all things happen. As a fierce warrior, known as a warrior king, he could have reached out and grabbed power and influence himself. He could have used it to indulge in the pleasures of this world, but he didn't. He would not kill or attack his predecessor, Saul, to take the throne for himself, even though on many occasions he was encouraged to. It had to be God who put him on the throne, or he didn't want it. He could have taken it many times. Meekness is not weakness. Such quality of character comes from a security in something greater. The person who shows such character has confidence in something much greater than themselves. Although they see the opportunity, they recognize they do not need it to establish their own significance. God is their significance, and they trust in that. Therefore, they do not need to strive for such things. Their sense of worth, their confidence, source of joy in life, comes from an external spiritual source and is birthed from within. They do not look to the outward things of the world to fulfill an inward desire. This is what a worldly person does and is consumed with a heart set on getting what they believe they need in this life. Jesus goes on in verse 6 and continues to say, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This does not mean that we should try to be good people. 
It does not mean, oh, I want to try harder to do what I should and try harder to avoid what I shouldn't. Righteousness does not come from ourselves. It is done to us. Righteousness does not come from ourselves. It is done to us. Leon Morris, in his book, The Gospel According to Matthew, points out, for all their intense longing, the seekers do not fill themselves with righteousness, but are filled. Righteousness is a gift of God. Sherman Johnson, in The Interpreters, reinforces this saying. He says, They depend not on their own power to achieve righteousness, but upon God. Its demands cannot be met by sheer willpower. I love that. Its demands cannot be met by sheer willpower. Any effort, any exercise of our willpower to be good people is evidence we are not living as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Any effort, any exercise of our willpower to be good people is evidence we are not living as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees, they were not hungry or thirsty for righteousness because they saw themselves as righteous. The kingdom of heaven person recognizes their utter dependency on God for righteousness. We are blessed as kingdom of heaven people because we have let go of our unachievable quest of self-righteousness and have turned to Jesus Christ in faith instead. The kingdom of heaven is very different, looks very different than what we are used to. The kingdom of heaven person is also merciful. In verse 7, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, this resonates with us today, as mercy has a very positive connotation in our culture, doesn't it? Yet in the days of Jesus, it was not so. The Romans, they despised pity. They despised mercy. It was weak. The Greek Stoics were cynical towards mercy and disapproved of it. The Pharisees were harsh in self-righteousness and felt harsh punishment was sufficient to keep people on track spiritually. But the kingdom of God person has not only seen the depth of sin in themselves and in the world, but has also therefore recognized the mercy they have received from God. This recognition generates mercy towards others William Hendrickson points out that mercy grows out of personal experience of the mercy of God. Mercy grows out of the personal experience of the mercy of God. Have you ever met people who are judgmental? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's because they are not kingdom of heaven people. They have yet to recognize their true spiritual bankruptcy, have not thrown themselves on God's mercy and yielded to Him in faith. They are stuck in trying to be who they think God wants them to be, trapped in their own belief of self-righteousness, unable to experience true blessedness, unable to extend mercy. Contrast this to the next verse. Verse 8, the pure in heart. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The pure in heart can see God in our world where others are blind to him. The pure in heart have received this from God. It's not something we can produce ourselves. It calls attention to the one who is clear in their inner desire, completely free from duplicity, now that word pure, when it says pure in heart, that word pure refers to pure white linen and pure, clean, clear glass. And the heart refers to our thoughts, our mind, our will, our emotions, our whole being. In our culture, we tend to separate the mind from the heart. 
right? We differ between our thought processes, what we're thinking, the mind, and our emotions, the heart, right? We like to separate those two. But when Jesus refers to pure in heart, he's including everything. The heart includes our thoughts, our intentions, our motivations, our emotions, our entire being. To be pure in heart, this seems utterly unachievable. To have pure motivations, pure intentions, pure thoughts. It seems unobtainable and impossible. It's one of those sayings of Jesus that we tend to water down or gloss over. And we water it down by saying things like, to be pure in heart means just be sincere in your intentions. Or, well, it's the thought that counts. Right? I know. (laughs) Oh, you're so pure in heart. (laughs) Yeah, that's not what it means at all. Not at all. No, this call to pure in heart is not a call for us to attain to and achieve. It's not just about being sincere. It's the description of a person in the kingdom of God. George Buttrick in The Interpreter says about the pure in heart. He says, pure of heart, it seems the most inaccessible. This beatitude does not mock us. God can cleanse the heart on the instant of penitent prayer. I love that. He says, this one, it, pure of heart, it seems the most accessible. Why does he say that? Because he gets what the word pure in heart means. No vile thoughts, no vile intentions, no impure motivations. It is our whole being there. But God can cleanse that. It's something that God can do. It seems impossible. We can't do it. But God can. Do you recognize a theme here? Hmm? Running throughout the Sermon on the Mount are these monumental statements which are not to make us feel helpless or confused, but to usher us into another kingdom, to give us a glimpse of what we were intended to be and perchance in faith turn from our ways and accept the saving work of Jesus Christ in our lives. George Buttrick again goes on to say, as long as people are at odds with God, they are at odds with themselves and with each other. As long as people are at odds with God, they are at odds odds with themselves and with each other. This leads us to the next beatitude in verse 9. The peacemakers. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We live in a world torn apart by animosities. People feed on hate and are lethargic towards love. All conflict springs from our alienation of God. We demand from each other to fulfill us or to give us what we believe will satisfy us. We take from others pure selfishness, which robs robs us of peace and causes pain. Peacemakers do not need from others, for they are connected with God and are therefore satisfied and fulfilled. Peace flows from people who do, do not demand anything from others, but instead pour into each other. The secure in spirit are not threatened by other people's successes, but rejoice in it. The children of God know who their daddy is. Their daddy has everything, is everything, is their all-sufficient provider, which puts them at peace and calls others into this rest. Peacemakers. And unfortunately, it doesn't always turn out well for the peacemakers, the pure in heart, the merciful, those without pretense and selfish ambition. As we read in the last section of our passage, with, which concludes with, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It doesn't mean be happy when bad things happen to you. That's not what it's saying. It's telling us to recognize that kingdom of heaven people are very different than those in the world. 
And this difference highlights depravity. Jesus, his message, the message of the disciples afterwards, the message of the early church, it was one of love. They did not war or grasp for power, but they lived lives full of God's spirit, yet they were severely persecuted. Imagine that. People with a message of love being persecuted. William Hendrickson points out that the kingdom of heaven person is a constant protest against the character of their opponents. The kingdom of heaven person is a constant protest against the character of their opponents. See, by the time Matthew wrote his gospel, persecution was not only a mark of leadership in the Christian movement, but anyone who associated as a Christian. It has always been the fate of kingdom people to be persecuted. The prophets of Israel's history, those who call people back to God, pointed the way back to God, experienced terrible persecution for speaking on behalf of God. And we don't really experience this type of persecution here in Canada, do we? Not like the church historically has or is experiencing in other parts of the world right now. We all experience the pain of life. This is common to everyone around the world in every culture and religion and is not unique to anyone. This persecution and insults because of one is because of one following Jesus because they manifest the righteousness of the kingdom of heaven. And many were tempted to abandon their faith because of it. Many did. We do not experience this in 21st century Canada the way they did, and many do in other parts of the world. It truly is difficult for us to connect with this part of the passage, and I honestly hope we never do. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is now. It is a connection with God. He invites us to experience it now, a taste of what is to come for everyone in all times, in all places of the world. It happens in our soul and affects our entire being, not something we work towards, but receive in God's great mercy by faith in him. So the question is, are you blessed? And would you like to be? Sherman Johnson finally points out to experience this type of blessedness. Such people cleave to God in simple trust. To experience this kind of blessedness, such people cleave to God in simple trust. So take some time today on your way home at a moment when you can. Submit to Jesus Christ in faith. Tell him you need him. Be in touch with your spiritual poverty and take it to Jesus, the one who has invited you into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, you have such a difficult message. But it calls us into something so incredibly amazing. We want to be kingdom people. Reveal to us our spiritual poverty. Help us to mourn. May we become the peacemakers, the merciful, those people you've called us to be not by trying to do it, but we want to experience a genuine change, genuine transformation within. And so we call on you and ask for you to do this in your name. Amen.